Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 105 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today's episode is a departure from some of our previous material, and it's more of a bonus episode than anything else. I recently appeared as a guest on the Thrive Unafraid podcast with Kelly Sayre and Doug Pattison. Kelly and Doug discuss a wide variety of topics that are of interest to a lot of my regular listeners as well, so I wanted to give you this opportunity to learn about their show. We discussed several different very interesting topics, including manipulation techniques that can be used against you and how to guard against them, as well as a story from espionage history of personal resilience in the face of tremendous adversity. Kelly is an expert on situational awareness and the author of the book, Sharp Women, Embrace Your Intuition, Build Your Situational Awareness, and Live Your Life Unafraid. She's also a frequent presenter, instructor, and podcast guest on related topics. You may remember Doug from episode two of my podcast all the way back at the beginning. He's a former CIA case officer who discussed the reality of life in the CIA with me, and in fact, that discussion is still my all-time most downloaded episode. So I hope you enjoy our discussion, and afterwards, make sure to subscribe to the Thrive Unafraid podcast with Kelly and Doug. Justin Black is a former member of the U.S. intelligence community who has worked in the Middle East, Central America, and Asia over more than a decade of service. A lifelong passion for history and storytelling drives him to explore the human side of spycraft. He is the host of an espionage history podcast, as well as a blog and Instagram account, all under the name Spycraft 101. And for those of our listeners who have been with us, you might remember that we spotlighted Spycraft 101 podcast in our first episode because my esteemed co-host, Doug Pattison, was a guest on Spycraft. So, excuse me, Spycraft podcast. Justin, it's great to have you. Thank you so much. We connected over the human behavior and some of our conversations back and forth about mindset. And I'm really excited to have you on the show tonight or to talk about some of those mindset life hacks, I guess you could call them, people overcoming impossible odds, really based on the mindset that they kept and stuck with that saw them through horrible things. I know you had mentioned one of the prisoners in China or a story somewhere along those lines. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for having me, Kelly. I appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time now, actually. And I'm glad you bring that up really quick. So his name was Hugh Redmond. He was somebody we had talked about a little bit. I did a post about him on Instagram over a year ago now, and his story is not very well known at all because there really is just so little documentation on it, unfortunately. And it's it's very sad to see someone like him who seems like he was just a tremendously strong and resilient person. He got caught up in the tides of history and forgotten by almost everyone, it seems. So he had... He started out, I believe he was in the OSS to begin with during the war, like a lot of, you know, these kinds of people were in the mid to late 40s. And people who are very familiar with that era of history, especially for the U.S. intelligence community, they might know or they might not know that the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, it was essentially disbanded just a couple of months after the war ended. So a lot of those people that had fought, you know, all the way through both theaters or all three theaters really kind of scattered to the four winds. Some of them went to the State Department, and then a few of them you know, went back to private life, civil service, whatever have you. And some went into a couple of organizations that were very had very short lifespans, kind of transitional organizations, I would call them. It was the Strategic Services Unit, 
which only lasted, I think, like a year. And there was also the Central Intelligence Group, which came right after that, which lasted, I think, maybe eight months or so. And then in 1947, the Central Intelligence Agency was formed. So they were so, kind of the original attempts at creating a CIA type organization. Is that what I'm getting from you? It was. I think that the entire government was in such a transition during that time period that they didn't have a clear idea of what was happening. And, you know, the, the, the threats were changing so completely at that time because, you know, the Soviet Union, we had been allied with them just months prior. And suddenly we're realizing that they had kind of had it out for us for a lot longer than we had realized. And, you know, we've been thoroughly penetrated in the United States government and society by Soviet agents since at least the early 1930s. And so once we kind of realized that they were the threat now that the Axis powers had been conquered, that, that you know, had to be like a massive pivot in strategy towards them. So these OSS disappeared. These other two organizations came and went fairly quickly. And Hugh Redman was a part of all three of those. Oh. So I'm mostly basing this on an article that was written a few years ago about him. It appeared in Studies in Intelligence, I think, which is kind of a, a professional publication. It's like a journal. And a lot of the articles are unclassified and they can be found online still. But he was sent to China because of the Maoist government there. You know, China, or I'm sorry, the government not taken over yet, but um, Mao was considered a threat. So he was building like a source network in China with the SSU, the Strategic Services Unit. And he had a network. He was in Shanghai. I think he had like at least seven Chinese agents that he was kind of running wow. there. And he eventually got picked up in China by the police there. In fact, he was boarding a ship back to the United States, I think. And they came on the ship and they took him off the ship just as he was about to leave. And this Oh, was that's in... the worst. You're so close. Oh You're so close it. to safety and freedom. I know it. So he was imprisoned and it kind of went into like a black hole at that time because we had very little visibility on what was really going on there. He was one of the very few people that, you know, trustworthy people in country at that time. So after that, the U.S. government had like almost no news about what was happening with him at all. And and what I'm sorry, was, what time frame was this? What year was he captured? He was captured. I think it was. Let me see. Or decade. I mean, you can. Yeah, here we go. So by 1951. So he had been through those organizations. He had been sent over by the Strategic Services Unit and just stayed there after that. So then he was in the CIG and then the CIA after that. So then by 1951, he's been there years. He's like, you know, our man in China, I guess. And ultimately he gets picked up and there's just so little visibility. There's really nothing that the U.S. government knows about him or can do about him or influence the his well-being or anything like that, unfortunately. So for years he is gone. You know, he, he does go on trial and we can kind of call it a show trial, but he he was conducting espionage there. I mean, he certainly was, right. you know, an American intelligence operative in China. So he goes into prison. And after that, they don't really hear much about him at all, except when other Western prisoners are released that were held with him. And some of those people are debriefed. And that, that is not including like other U.S. government employees. It's like French priests and just, you know, a few other Westerners that were thought to be maybe, you know, conducting espionage or something like that. And you know, sporadically they're released. So they get debriefed eventually. And that's really the only record of his life that we have anymore. But he was held for the next 15 years wow. in prison in China. There was a little bit of discussion back and forth. And at one point, let me see when it was, it was 1957. So about six years after he was taken, eventually they worked out a compromise where his mother was able to fly over and visit him. And, you know, she's 75 years old or something like that. He's in his 40s already. I don't think he was married before he went over. So, and she's the only one allowed to come visit. So there is a picture of the two of them together. And, you know, he's very happy to see her. She's very, you know, nerve wracked. You can tell from the photo, very stressed out. He doesn't look particularly healthy. He's a very big strapping guy who's clearly like a shell of his former self, you know, in borrowed clothing in the photo. And it's really tragic to see, but some of these that happened over the years painted like a really incredible picture of this guy, because even though he genuinely had no hope of rescue and no apparent hope of, you know, being traded back or anything like that, you know, like is more common these days, the Chinese were absolutely not willing to let go of him at that time. So he was pretty constantly 
interrogated. You know, they would always try and get him to admit to what he had done. I mean, years and years and years he was interrogated. And one of the things that they said was that he would play these, you know, mind games back with the interrogators all the time. And he won a bunch of little like psychological victories, even though he had no chance of any kind of, you know, tangible victory at all. But he would just have this battle of wits with these interpreters, all the, or these interrogators all the time. And uh, like one of the things that the former prisoner said was that he would refuse to speak until they gave him a cigarette and lit it for him. So after that, like that little act of servitude there, then he would open up to them. So just a tiny little thing like that, but it really sets a tone for what's to come after that, in my opinion, and really sets like who is the dominant figure in that room. Not in any meaningful sense, but in that psychological sense, which is just so, so impressive to me that he could keep something up like that over the years. So he also, um, you know, he was in a room, he was in solitary confinement by himself. And for fitness, he would walk a circle in his room, which was, you know, it's like an eight by eight cell or something like that. He would walk circles in that room 15 miles a day to keep up his health as best he could. So that's, I don't know, 10,000 circles in that tiny little cell of his, probably something like that, 15 miles a day. So that's got to be, you know, roughly five hours of walking in circles every single day just for his health. Wow. So it's it's hard to know what that would do to someone's mind, but he apparently was resilient enough to stay strong through all of that and not give up anything according to the other people who are there serving their service, their sentences with him. So, so really his history, his story was pieced together through others' accounts. So when you think yes. about it, they didn't have very many interactions with him. If he was in solitary confinement, he was there for 15 years. He wasn't allowed to see anyone except his mom. And mm -hmm. so to be able to communicate or project the mindset that kept him alive for that long in such short snippets that people still picked up and were so impressed with that they shared it when they got back. Do you have any examples mm -hmm. of, you know, besides a psychological game with interrogators, any examples from the mindset that were told through some of these debriefs from other prisoners that were released? Gosh, I would have to go back and read the original article again, because it's been over a year since I read it. Yeah, it's been a year and a half, actually, since I read it, I think. But it's a really wonderful story. It's very, very in-depth from what they know. And if I recall correctly, a lot of it had to do with how they took care of his family members stateside as well, to the best of their ability, the organization did. But the um, the U.S. government side. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, a lot of the administrative stuff, like you know, like a person who's a prisoner of war, they still get pay and they still get benefits and that sort of thing, and how all of that is handled. So, you know, there was a lot of efforts to take care of the family, but there was really nothing that they could do for him where right. he was. He was able to write home one letter a month. You know, I'm sure that they were very carefully examined and censored and that sort of thing. So, I don't recall that there was any kind of, you know, useful information that came out of those letters, but it, it did give insight into his mindset. It was his own narrative right. of what was happening there, you know, what he was able to get out. And towards the end, he was, you know, he was, he was in a difficult position physically and psychologically by the very end, you know, he had not given up hope, but he, he had truly acknowledged, you know, like he would acknowledge in a letter to his mother, just how miserable the conditions were, which was something it took him many, many years to get to the point of, you know, expressing that kind of physical complaint to the person who would be hurt most, you know, to her, know about her son's suffering, of course. Right. So that's tough. And apparently his, his, his teeth all fell out, you know, from the diet after almost 19 years he was held. So he, he was just, you know, rotting away in a literal sense in this jail cell, you know, for years and years and years. And finally in 1970, 1970, now he was taken in 51, Chinese government announced that he had passed away and they gave no other details about it. They didn't say we executed him. They didn't say, you know, he committed suicide. He died of a disease, a preventable disease, anything like that. So as far as I know, there's still no actual cause of death that's been released. You know, maybe he succumbed to a beating or something like that, or maybe his heart gave out, you know, who knows really, but his family felt like it was a murder. And, you know, when you control the circumstances to that extent, I guess it could be called a murder, right? no matter what happened, but just a, a terribly difficult situation. But he really set a tremendous example from for the other prisoners. And they all spoke in very, very high regard of him. And those were just about the only people to see him for all those years were, you know, French guy, you know, a couple of other Europeans, you know, just a handful of people, but they were, you know, deeply touched, deeply moved by his own behavior, you know, when there was, you know, the odds were stacked against him. 
Right. Well, and it's, I think it says something to being able to stay in touch with reality in that environment Mm -hmm. and admit that this is not, you know, not completely check out from reality to create a world that you could live in mentally, really, because physically you can escape. You're in the cell. And then yet keep the mindset of not giving up. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it really reminds me of Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And I don't know if you've read that or, or Doug, if you've read that. I feel like people mention it a lot of times, but Dr. Frankl was basically in a concentration camp. And he it's a firsthand account of what he experienced, how he knew which prisoners were going to make it and which were not because mm-hmm. of mindset. Uh, mm-hmm. Doug, have you read that book? I've not read that book, but but the concept certainly is, is familiar. When you look at many of the soft units, they, they often can tell who is most likely to make it from the beginning, not based on physical prowess, but based on mindset. And soft is special operations forces. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> well, the other thing about Redmond's story, too, that connects, I think, is it's a pretty tremendous example of how he managed even in in difficult times to use emotional manipulation to control his captors and and improve his situation along the way as well Mm -hmm. right absolutely no indication that he took the other route which was you know trying to give them what they wanted essentially you know i'm sure that they were promising a lot of things at one time or another that would have tangibly improved his circumstances they probably dangled a lot of things as well that they were had no intention of giving you know, but apparently he did not give into that by any account. Do you have any female examples, Justin? And I only ask because I feel like so often it the females don't find themselves in a prisoner of war situation, mm-hmm. typically. And correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, if there are stories and I'm I'm unaware of them. But do you have any examples to talk about that female mindset? Because for me, I think women tend to think of others more than themselves. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious how the mindset would be different. Sure. So not not a prisoner story, like you said, not exactly. But I did have an episode several months ago about the women agents, female agents of the British Special Operations Executive during World War II. And the guest was Kate Vigers. She's a British historian. And she wrote a book called Mission France, which I read and which was very, very good. And it focused on, I want to say about 32, mostly about 32 specific female agents, because there were more than that. There are a lot more than that, but a lot of the records are very incomplete for the SOE. So she was able to pull a lot of stuff together for these various agents. And some of them are very well known, like Virginia Hall is one of the most famous ones, especially because she was an American and she, you know, later joined the CIA as well. But there was one woman that the story just kind of struck me like a lightning bolt, honestly, when I read it in the book. And then I had to discuss it with with Kate as well. It's a woman named Mary Herbert who was deployed to France. And, you know, a lot of them, they were picked because of their ability to speak French. Of course, a lot of them had no kind of, you know, military or intelligence background or anything like that. But the whole country was mobilizing, you know, the whole the whole continent was mobilizing really at that time. Right. So, you know, trained up and sent over and stayed there for a very long time, you know, months and years even in occupied territory working. So Mary Herbert was a part of a circuit, which is was the British term at the time for one of their one of their operational teams. And these teams were in incredible danger all the time. Many of them, many of them were killed or captured or disappeared. I want to say something like maybe 50 percent. I, I can't quote that for certain, but I, many, many, many people that went over there, you know, never made it back in the end. So Mary was on a team for quite some time and she ended up falling in love with someone else on the circuit, one of the male agents on the circuit. And while she's in France on mission in occupied territory, she became pregnant. She carried the baby to term. She had the baby in France all while living undercover and, you know, performing missions, you know, as a, as a courier and and that sort of thing. So, I mean, she was, you know, literally carrying her baby. I was like, that's actually the perfect cover. Most people aren't going to be suspicious of a pregnant lady. Oh, I know it. I know it. Absolutely. That's, it's hard to imagine. It's, you know, she would have a lot of good reasons, I think, to be out in the night, you know, oh, I can't sleep or, you know, oh, I'm on my way to see the doctor, you know, something like that, you know, would explain, you know, 
riding around on her bicycle in the countryside, that sort of thing. So she gives birth to the baby. And not long after that, Gestapo were on the trail of all of these circuits and they, they rolled up a lot of them. I mean, they, they were very, very good at what they did. They were excellent, you know, counterintelligence, counter espionage teams there. And so they end up tracking this circuit to a safe house. And Mary is in the safe house at that time. And she is, they don't know that they're not looking for Mary specifically, but they have figured out that there might be someone at this particular house that's working for British intelligence. So they go to the house. Mary is asleep in bed with her baby when the Gestapo break in, the German, you know, secret police break in or that, you know, they come to the door and force their way inside anyway. And, you know, when I read that, you know, I'm, I'm not a woman and I can't, you know, truly understand what's going through her mind, but it's, it's gotta be the most horrifying thing imaginable. You know, it's, it's terrifying enough as an adult, you know, fending for yourself, but to have a defenseless baby at your side, your defenseless baby at your side, when this nightmare scenario finally happens is, it's just, it's hard to put myself in that place. And she's got to, you know, maintain her cover. She's got to stay calm, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And, you know, well, and in your head, you know, you're guilty. You know that they (laughs) really want you and you've got to pretend that you don't know that. Yes. Yes. I don't recall exactly. Like, I'm not sure if she had anything compromising on her or in the room at the time. You know what I mean? I'm not sure if there was like, it was cashed away somewhere else or if there was anything that they could have found during a search. But as it turned out, they were looking for another woman, not Mary, who, who was a member of the circuit, but she was not there at the time. So Mary was able to deflect, say, that's not me. You know, they had a photo of the woman. They could tell it was not Mary. And so I guess they decided there's no way that a woman with a newborn baby would be a British agent here in France. So they ended up leaving without doing anything to her or taking the baby. And, you know, I, I don't know how she didn't quit right after that, but she stayed on mission. She was able to send the baby away, you know, for the remainder of her time in France, if I recall correctly. And, you know, they were reunited after the war and, you know, many years together after that, thank goodness. And I actually, I think the baby is still alive. Well, the baby, the woman is still alive now. You know, she's in her, her eighties, I think, but I believe that Mary's daughter is still alive right now. And certainly no memory of that event, but I'm sure great memories of her mother, but yeah, that was one of those, you know, I read a lot of interesting stories in these books. I do a lot of research into some interesting characters. And that is one that absolutely stuck with me. Like, how in the world do you find yourself in that situation and then talk your way out of it in a way that deflects the attention of the people who are here to take you away, brutalize you and probably execute you, you know, if they figure out who you are? Well, I think this is the a perfect little segue into what we had wanted to also discuss was manipulation. In my mind, what she Mary sounds like she was doing was manipulating her truth or manipulating the truth to keep herself and her baby safe. A lot of times when I speak to women, when it comes to their personal safety, you know, immediately the mama bear thing isn't always about a physical aggression, but it's always about how do I keep my kids safer? What will I endure in order to protect my kids? What do I need to say? What do I, how, how can I manipulate the predator, the attacker to kind of forget about my kids and focus on me and Mm -hmm. hopefully no matter what happens, my kids will be okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had talked on our pre-conversation to this call, we had talked about, I think it's interesting that manipulate manipulation is a dirty word. It feels icky, feels gross. But really, mm-hmm. me trying to get my kids to clean their room some days is manipulation. Because me yep. telling them over and over again doesn't always work. So how can I make it a game so that they feel excited about cleaning their room? You know, how can I make it a game so they finish their vegetables? Whatever it may be. So, I, I mean, I'd love to, if you're okay with it, jump right into that conversation and get both of your opinions on manipulation in general, and then we can go into some tactics used. Sure. Manipulation is morally neutral is what you're saying. It it can be used for ill or it can be used for good, but on its own, it's just a morally neutral tool. Is that another Dougism or is that a real thing, Doug? (laughs) Because that, no, that's, I've never, I've never heard that term before, but I think that's a great. Morally neutral. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good way to explain unbiased thinking Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. no it's how you use it a tool is just a tool it's how you use it that really makes it 
you know, one way or the other, lethal or not, or whatever. Everything to me can be, you know, it's like moderation. Don't eat too much well, cake. You're going to get a cavity. I, I think it's gotten such a bad rap because most folks don't like thinking that they are easily manipulated. And so, well, and do you think it's, they don't like to think they're manipulating others? Like I'm a good person. I would never manipulate someone. No, I think everybody would acknowledge that they are more than happy to manipulate others to serve their own goals <laughs> because they think their goals are, are better goals. However, would, would hate the idea of being manipulated themselves. Interesting. What do you think about that, Justin? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that we, well, first of all, whatever manipulation we've decided to do, we've already justified it in our own mind somehow, some way. So to us, it is the correct thing to do because we've decided to do it in that sense. You know, we're not being coerced into manipulating because that would be manipulation as well. (laughs) That's manipulation on top of manipulation, which does happen. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I'm of the opinion, I'm like a, a student studying it rather than a teacher or a master of manipulation or anything like that. You know, I'm constantly learning about it, but I'm of the opinion that almost any interaction between two people involves manipulation, you know, subconscious sometimes, but, or unwitting sometimes, you know, but I mean, all of our interactions essentially are manipulation. They're not, not necessarily for a zero sum game or anything like that, but everything, our posture, our tone, all of that involves presenting our argument or our desire or, you know, what we're the idea that we're trying to communicate in a way that will be received effectively by the other person. So in a sense, all of us are manipulating each other to a certain extent every single day and every single interaction. That's my right. I want to strengthen this friendship. I want that person to think better of me. I want my boss to like the outcome of my report. I want this, that, or the other thing. Yeah. Wow. See, I, I have to disagree with you two. I, (laughs) I feel like, gosh, does that mean that everything is premeditated all my conversations can i you know i'm and and i'm not saying i'm right maybe i've just never really thought of it from that perspective but that makes me feel like ev- there's no such thing as just a great conversation with authenticity and curiosity for another person versus i'm trying to get something back from it you know, I'm trying to get a friendship or I'm trying to get your approval for me or who I am, even if you're a stranger and I just happen to sit next to you on the airplane. You know, to me, I, I don't know. Is there a difference between that or is it always the the end? There's some game that I'm playing that I'm trying to improve my position socially or. Well, as Justin said, I think it's not always intentional. Right. That that right. was your, your goal. It may just be the pattern that, that folks operate within. It, it may be the, the goal is to make the other person feel good. The goal may be to learn something, which could be, a, you know, you're manipulating the conversation in order to learn something from that mm-hmm. person that you sat next to on the airplane. So I, I don't think you have to think of it as wholly a negative outcome. Well, right. That goes right. back to the moral neutral conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, I think like, for example, having good manners is a form of manipulation because you are trying to create a desired outcome from this interaction, which, you know, might just be, you want to, you know, be the recipient of those good manners from the other person as well. Uh, saying please and thank you, you know, they're creating a little bit of a social contract mm-hmm. there in a way. And, you know, people might be listening and, you know, that's, it's not a cynical way of, of looking at it at all. It's just, you know, human interaction involves a, a give and a take at all times. So I think I try to be cognizant of that and, you know, use it not only to my benefit, but to the benefit of others, because quite frankly, you know, you can manipulate somebody into doing what is actually best for them and what is best for the team and what is best for you as well. You getting know, which, so kids, everybody wins. Yeah. Getting my kids to clean their room. Well, I did find this article how to identify 12 most common manipulation tactics, because I think there is a fear out there. When it comes to my personal safety, how do I know if I'm being manipulated? And Mm. we're going to put all of the 12 tactics in the episode key. So for anyone listening, you can go download these so that you can kind of see, gosh, is my coworker Using some manipulation tactics right now in a negative way with ill intentions is the stranger who's 
offering their assistance, Good Samaritan. So you can go to the website, thediamondarogroup.com and check out the podcast page and get the episode key for this episode. But I, there was two on here that I really thought tied together and were some interesting things underneath that we could talk about. And lies and denial. It says some manipulators lie quite often and they often have to cover their tracks with further falsehoods to cover up the original lie. Yeah. Once you start the lie, you got to keep lying. And to me, I don't know how people do that. I don't know how they keep their lies straight. Link, if I'm, I just have to be honest because it's, it just doesn't work for me. My brain can't process and keep track of different stories. Who did I tell what to? No, thank you. Oh, I know it. I know it. Yeah, I instinctively go towards the truth, which actually doesn't always serve your <laughs> interests sometimes. Yeah. You know, you would think it does. And most of the time in the long run, it will. But, you know, giving the, the truth to somebody, especially like a stranger, won't always be lead to exactly what you need, especially if you're trying to gain entry somewhere or get a discount or, you know, some some simple. I want VIP like that. access. Come on. Right, right, right. Exactly. You know, there's some very harmless ways to manipulate somebody and gain a benefit, but it doesn't actually hurt anyone. It doesn't break the law or anything like that. But yeah, the lies. When I've gone through like training scenarios, you know, many years ago, the thing that served me very well at the time was to stick as close, close, close to the truth as I possibly could. And so that, you know, only 5% of what I was saying was actually a falsehood and everything else was like, oh, you know, I see why you would think that, but it's actually because of, you know, this specific scenario. And that is a lot easier because you don't feel like you're telling a big lie. You're telling a very, very small lie in a multi-sentence story, for example. So that did serve me well in these training scenarios, certainly. So I have a thought on that. But before I, before I just talk right away, Doug, did you have anything you wanted to mention? Well, I, I might have some experience with lying for a long time. <laughs> okay, well, then I will say my and bit is how the heck, if you're telling, just to use your example, Justin, 95% truth and only 5% lie. I feel like that's finding the needle in the haystack. If I'm trying to evaluate a predator or a, a somebody with ill intentions, mm -hmm. how do I know if you're lying to me? So Doug, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think you, I think you have to learn, well, one, you have to assess motivations, right? And, and thinking through what, what's the motivation that this other person is bringing to the table? Is that motivation something that's going to drive them towards an end that may serve them better than it's serving me? Can you use an um, example? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I, well, I think it, it gets rooted in understanding how to listen to that voice inside you that's that says there's something off here mm -hmm. or that, that this person is pushing me towards something that doesn't feel right that's pushing me towards an outcome that benefits them from this interaction more than it benefits me. And are they willing to manipulate or lie or, or push through that in order to accomplish their, their goal? That makes but, me think of the security door surfing. Mm -hmm. So kind of Gavin De Becker's book, Gift of Fear, the opening story he uses. Well, no, actually I take, I'm going to take that back. When somebody is, oh, it's raining outside. We better hurry and both get in the building and you pull out your key card to swipe and they don't. And you, maybe you don't recognize them. You're, Who are you? But oh yeah, you're telling the truth. We should get out of the rain. But wait a minute. Do you have a key card? So I think to me that assessing the motivation, you want to get inside, but you don't have a key card. So that getting curious, it would, do you think that matches? Oh yeah, for sure. And, and I think listening for other clues in the story. So liars, people who prepared lies to tell, to accomplish some sort of goal often end up sharing far more information than a normal story might have with it or a normal, you know, line of, of statements and it's because they've built this narrative and now they want to get all of this narrative out and, and use it. So listening for too much detail in there may be a mechanism by which you can understand this person's lying to you. Body language is another key as well. And when you say body language, the nonverbals. Yeah. Non nonverbals and how they're how they're engaging with you at, at again, barring somebody being an actual psychopath, 
you know, it lying is still a moral challenge for many folks. And so their bodies will g- provide clues that can be picked up on. What are some of those clues? Like what, because to me, again, in your past as a CAA officer, you had to lie. So you had to come yep. up with those narratives. So how, how did you untrain your body clues or how did you know, I know that I do this fidget when I'm lying or my tell? I, I didn't, I didn't fidget. Like, I mean, well, yeah, or whatever said, your tell was, how did you work on being a psycho, Barring being a psychopath. <laughs> I'm not saying well, you're a psychopath, Doug. <laughs> no, I am. No, <laughs> I think, well, one, they're not the same for everybody. So they have to be assessed in, in the context of each individual person. So if somebody who says that somebody who always looks up and to the left is lying and somebody who looks up and to the right, there's some science behind some of that because at one level, you're looking to your memory versus looking. So you're, you're drawing information from your memory versus drawing information from a made up place. And, you know, we, there is some training that can be done and, and, hypothetically might be done on how to, you know, reduce tells like that for folks. And I'm so glad you bring that up because I hear that. I remember that sticking in my head as a myth. If somebody looks up and to the left, they're lying. And I was like, ah, I do that when I'm trying to think or jog my memory to recall a fact. I'm not lying. I'm trying to remember. So I'm glad you bring that up. You're accessing your RAM. What? You're accessing your RAM. Yeah. Yeah. Blowing the dust off of it most days. What do you think, Justin? (laughs) Yeah, there there are definitely some tells. I I read a a very good book a number of years ago called What Everybody is Saying. Everybody is Two Words by Joe Navarro. And that book is great because not only does it have a lot of information, it has a ton of pictures as well. So you can actually see the posture and the expressions and that sort of thing. So very, very helpful. I've, I've actually read it a couple of times. And um, so I, after I read that book, I started looking around and I started seeing some of the things from the book. So, you know, I don't recall every single thing from it, but I've definitely picked up on body language cues a number of times since then. Things like if a person is sitting across from me and their feet start moving under the table because they can't see their feet because they're under the table, but I can see them because of the angle. That's a real indicator to me, for mm-hmm. example, and, you know, shifting in the seat and that sort of thing. And my child, obviously, I can tell when she's lying to me, but I guess you know, everybody can tell <laughs> about that just because you know them so well. Right. Well, that's but, you have a good baseline to Doug's point. Right, right. Everyone's going to have a different tell mm-hmm. and your own child or the, somebody that you live with, spend a lot of time with, you're going to get to know them. That's why best mm-hmm. friends don't have to say a word and they know when something's up. Absolutely. So one of the things that I do, like when I am being interviewed, like for a job or something like that, ever since I read that book. I really plant myself in that seat. And it's not because I'm planning to lie and I don't want any of my tells to give me away. It's because I don't want any of the nervous body language showing that is typical for a job interview. Excuse me. So I tend to be very, very cognizant of my own body language when I'm really face to face with a person, you know, three feet away and we're discussing something of any importance at all. I'm paying a lot of attention to myself and I'm paying a lot of attention to them as well. You know, and you break up a good point is studying and watching people's body language. It's people watching Mm one-on-one. And I hear often that people love doing that. I love people watching. Okay. We'll take it a step further and make it a, make it a habit when you're out, instead of going on your phone and looking at your phone while you're in a public place, keep it away, keep it down, keep it whatever in your pocket and look at the people around you. What does their body language tell you? If you see two people sitting at a booth or, or talking to one another, what is the body language telling you? You know, is one wanting to get away, one really nervous by having the conversation, or are they both comfortable and engaged? But that's mm-hmm. we can make, we'll make that the daily habit for this this episode, which we'll put in the episode key that they can download. But give some tips and tricks for watching and reading body language when they're out in public. But absolutely, when it comes to that manipulation and the lies, are there ways, is there anything that you can give us or tell us, either of you, either Doug or Justin, how do we know? Is there anything 
that we can do when it comes to the lying to test, you know, like, is there a way to ask back or do anything like that? Well, something Doug said very early on stuck with me because it, it seemed it rang so true. And that is people giving you more information than is totally necessary. I, I pick up on that relatively frequently, especially if I'm asking a yes or no question, and then I get a three sentence answer. I know that they're spinning a story out there and it is a, either they're a, you know, their mind is going, you know, hundred miles an hour or they're trying to spin that web of lies, you know, to kind of reel me in. So I, I pay a lot of attention to that with the lies. It, for me, it's so different from some of the context that, you know, a lot of your listeners might find and the, the personal security perspective. But I do think that the paying attention to everyone around you, it can be equally or more entertaining and useful than whatever is on your phone at that given moment, <laughs> quite frankly. So yeah, if you spend time looking, the more time you spend looking, you know, three months from now, a year from now, you might be able to pick up on those cues that you've never read in a book and nobody's ever told you about. You just learn them through observation. And that could absolutely be a lifesaver one day. I agree. And building on that, you know, even Shakespeare said, methinks thou do, the lady does protest too much. Mm -hmm. Right. And and what he was talking about there in Hamlet was that this oh, insincere overacting was able to be interpreted as not truthful. Mm -hmm. So the dramatic or over the top, mm -hmm. basically. Well, and, But including too much information. Right. I mean, some of the other in this article, it was changing the subject. Oh, moving the goalposts, using fear to control another person. So there's all these things that we can talk about. Like I said, we could talk for hours, but I, I really wanted to then focus on another topic in this article or another call out they did for manipulation tactics was gaslighting. I feel like there's a lot of conversation around gaslighting or we're hearing that word more and more. And it not only applies in personal relationships, but it can apply in work. It can apply in friends and Basically, the gaslighting then causes the victim to doubt their own perception of reality by denying or distorting the truth. And mm -hmm. they may deny certain events happen. I feel like I hear this a lot when women are sharing their story and another person says, oh, you were probably overreacting. That's not how it happened. And they start to second guess their perception mm -hmm. of an event and having to remind them the other person wasn't there in your shoes. If that manipulator was targeting you, they, they're going to want to create witnesses. And it talks about this in the article is they're recruiting others to aid in the manipulation. They want everybody to think they're phenomenal. So that they're gaslighting you almost unintentionally. Well, mm -hmm. he, he's always been great to me. She's always been fair with me. It must be something that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Isolating that person, because I think that like a true gaslighter, they're not going to be targeting everyone. You know, it's not going to be a broad swath of people they're doing it to. I think that they're going to target an individual, the one that they think is either that, you know, they need to convince that person of something or that they think is the most easily manipulated, especially like in an office setting or, you know, a peer group or something like that. Like you mentioned, if you're talking about like a domestic, you know, relationship of some sort, romantic relationship, then of course there's only going to be one target for that generally. But right. yeah, if you're talking about, you know, within a group of people, you know, there's going to be a, a shark circling somewhere and they're going to be looking for the, the perfect prey. So I do think there are people who engage in habits, right? And, and the, you know, I, I can envision somebody who has a habit of gaslighting others in order to avoid personal responsibility or, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. I think it happens, you know, we talk about the moral neutral conversation on manipulation. I'd be curious because I've wondered this myself to get both of your opinions on is gaslighting morally neutral? No. Yeah, I, I definitely don't think so. Okay. Why? Because it's specifically as manipulation intended to cause the other person to doubt themselves, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's out of the gate, has a negative 
intent as it relates to the other person. Well, that makes it a negative intent. So what if you're using, I you said know, it's not morally neutral. Okay. Justin, do you want to go? Yeah, I agree. If you're, if you're using this, this definition where you're trying to convince someone that something didn't actually happen, then, you know, denying the existence of an event, you know, or convincing someone that an event never occurred. I, I don't see any positive benefit to that at all. I don't, I don't see a, a morally, you know, upright use of that particular technique at all. It's, a moral technique is, you know, convincing some or, you know, showing someone your perspective and putting it in the best light possible. You know, there are plenty of uh, benign uses of that kind of thing, but telling someone that you're completely wrong and what you think happened didn't happen, there's, you know, unless they are actually wrong, then it's not gaslighting. But yeah, I've, I've right. never seen a, a positive spin on that, honestly. I can't imagine yeah. one. It's intended to sow self-doubt and confusion. Mm -hmm. And well, that again so goes back to the intention of the user, a person using that tactic. Right. But if it, if so, it, so gaslighting must have a negative intent or it's not gaslighting. Okay. What would it be if it wasn't a negative intent? It'd be legitimately telling the other person that they were wrong about the, the, the thing that they didn't well their remember. perception because that's one thing i was like okay but it's to doubt their own perception of a reality mm -hmm. and our perceptions are our reality so if someone is stuck in a perception i use the example a lot of times i thought volkswagens were hor volkswagen beetle cars bugs were awful cars because my dad had a negative experience when he was 18 on a motorcycle and so from the time he was very young I was like, those are the worst cars in the world. Hmm. That was the perception of my reality. It's not a reality. It's just my perception. So if somebody's but like- But you correct your perception by stating they're not the worst cars in the world, that's not gaslighting. Right. So, what is, so that would be a positive way to help someone change the perception of their reality. So what would that be called? What would that be? I'm not a shrink. <laughs> yeah. This is the questions I have in my head. I don't have the answers either. Justin, well, do you have the, any idea? The only thing I'm thinking of right now, I mean, there are people that that do genuinely perceive things incorrectly. I'm th you know, someone with like a, a legitimate mental illness or something like that, like a, a schizophrenic person who's in therapy or something like that. They might need help seeing the world as it actually is. So they're, if you're approaching it from like a, a, a therapeutic kind of way, you know, and you were like, a, you know, like a licensed professional or something like that, then you, you do, you are charged with maybe potentially changing someone's perspective and convincing them that what they saw isn't reality. So I'm also not a psychologist or psychiatrist, so I can't really speak to that, you know, super <laughs> knowledgeably or authoritatively. But I mean, some, some people do perceive things incorrectly and it can be helpful, but those are, I wouldn't necessarily call them rare cases, but you're talking about like in the context of a, of a visiting with a professional Mm -hmm. because you generally need some help, not because you're in a relationship with somebody who, you know, doesn't have a job and wants you to continue paying for everything, you know, or something like that. Right. And I'm, you know, it'd be, it'll be interesting to see what kind of comments we get on this episode mm -hmm. from, yeah, I should feel like the disclaimer that we're going to put on this episode is none of us are licensed psychologists, psychiatrists. <laughs> right. This was us having conversation and asking some of the questions that maybe other people have and having a good discussion around it. I mean, there's so much. I would actually much. love to see some. How, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I would actually love to hear some, like read some comments from your followers on their own examples of gaslighting in, the, in their life. I'm sure that some of them have some of those or a friend, you know, that's been through it and told them all about it or something like that. I'm sure there's some very, very useful examples out there to learn from. Oh, I, I mean, when I deal with someone who has a substance abuse problem in their life, and the, their loved ones or their closest ones, there's a lot of that gaslighting and manipulation in order to continue their habit. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's experienced by a lot of people, I think, and not knowing that's what it is or is it that? Because it's not necessarily that they have ill intentions, but they, you know, so it's, it's one of those gray areas that I like having mm -hmm. discussion on to expand my understanding. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many other, you know, common manipulation tactics in this article that 
<laughs> that's why we're putting together the episode key so everyone can go in and look at it themselves because that's really hard from my perspective what I hear from women how do I know I'm being manipulated how mm -hmm. do I know this person I love this person I trust my boss you know my best friend of however many years because I might be in denial oh yeah and I was how... just thinking that there are people that they've been so thoroughly gaslit for so many years that they will, it'd be almost impossible to convince them that that's actually what's happening. They're going to think you're the one doing the gaslighting. Right. They're going to gaslight that, you. That, yeah. That's you yeah. have the wrong perception of my reality. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like I got to cut that Kelly out of my life. She's talking. <laughs> well, that, that part's true. <laughs> you guys, are you gaslighting me? And I'm not making fun of this. See, now I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> Thanks gentlemen. Throwing me Do Logan and I both bus. be wrong about this Kelly? I don't think so. <laughs> I, is there anything though? I know we're getting close to the end here, so I don't, I could talk for hours on this, especially with you two and asking these questions. I love it. It's challenging my thought process, but is there anything else when it comes to manipulation that if you said, I just want everyone to think of this next time they feel like they're being manipulated, ask yourself this or get curious about this or what would be that one hint that you would offer. Justin, you want to start? That's a good question. I need a second to think about it, honestly. I well, feel I, like- Doug, there, ahead. we'll have Doug go. I'll jump in for you, Justin. I, I think I'd ask them to think about what the end goals would be for this person who they feel like is, is perhaps manipulating them. I want to be really cautious to send everybody out in the world and, and turn them into pop psychologists evaluating every single conversation, every single behavior, every single sentence that's that's made, even even the point about turning people watching into a more intentional activity brings with it risks. Right. So we we want people to we want people to be measured in how they think about this. Right. The world in some respects is out to get them, but the world is also not out to get them. And, and so you, there's a, there's a balance in there and the balance is different for every single person. So as I look at whether I'm being manipulated, one, I want to think about what is it that, that I would offer that this person might be working towards, right? And, you know, back to the, the core measures of, of thinking about personal security is what is it I'm trying to protect? What do I have to protect it with? And what am I trying to protect it against? Right. So even at that personal level, what is this person hoping to get at that would cause them to want to go down a path of manipulation? And how do I harness my awareness towards defending against that through listening to and, and monitoring what they're doing? That's great. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would want to instill confidence rather than paranoia in people. Right. And quite frankly, it's easy to branch off and go down that path to paranoia. And, you know, many people do. And then you can find, you know, you can find online communities that will just continue to, you know, build on that if you want to, because of how, you know, many splintered communities there are out there. But yeah, I think that everyone's circumstances are different, but most people are not out to get you that you see in your daily walk in life. You know, even most people trying to get something from you aren't necessarily trying to harm you in the, in the trade right there. So have to keep that into consideration. But I, I think that if you really take some of the, the lessons of that and just use your powers of observation that we all have. And I mean, I really use them, you know, like really concentrate on those and exercise it like a muscle that you'll start to, it, it will shift your perspective on a lot of things and it will show you the bad. And some people to boat will show you the good in others as well, the good in many others as well. Excellent. You know, my one thing that I would ask or ask the listeners to think about is you can't control the other person. Right. And you're not really truly ever going to know their full intentions because you're not in their head. So keeping your safety, your priority in any situation where your intuition is telling you, hmm, something's off with this person. Are they manipulating me? You start questioning their intentions. Pause and keep your priority of your safety, of your personal safety. And if you don't feel comfortable in a situation, focus on you and what you control and, and stick with that. 
because you don't, it's not up to you to figure out someone's intentions. As long as you're safe, if something makes you uncomfortable, it's completely okay to say, you know, if they're asking you, let's say, so they're telling lies, oh, why they need something. They, you know, they need you to help on this project or, hey, you know, I need some money. I'm, I ran out of gas down the road, whatever it may be. If something feels off to you and you don't feel comfortable engaging further with this individual, keeping your safety a priority might look like, you know, in, in the example of the project at work, let's say, I don't. I don't have an answer right now. You know, I have to think about that. I've got to look at my calendar. I've got to look at some of the things that I have to get done or the deadlines approaching. So let me get back to you. Buy yourself some time to get a definitive answer to someone if something doesn't feel right, but you can't quite put your finger on it. Or in a situation where let's say it's outside of work, buy yourself time by saying, oh my gosh, I forgot, you know, like when I talk about getting into an elevator, if you don't want to get into an elevator with someone that's making you uncomfortable, you don't have to step in. You think of some lines that you could use. Hey, I, oh my gosh, I forgot the coffee pot on at home, or I've got to call my mom or, oh, I think I left my car unlocked. Buy yourself time, create space, making sure your safety is a priority is always going to be the best option. So that's what I would want listeners to walk away from is trusting your intuition and keeping your safety a priority. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for coming on and spending time with Doug and I. That was that was an interesting conversation. I hope the listener, you enjoy it as well. Please take Justin up on his offer to share comments or questions or stories about times of Maybe you experienced some gaslighting or things that you found helpful to combating manipulation techniques. Like I said, we're going to put all 12 of the manipulation tactics from this article in the episode key. So you can go download that key and take a look at it and consider some of the ways to think about, hmm, am I being manipulated right now? And questions to ask yourself. Special shout out to our main podcast sponsor, Mace. Mace and the community safety that they are building that's part of their mission. They're not just about a product. They're more about building safety in the communities, bringing awareness to personal safety. So we're so happy to be partnered with them on the Thrive Unafraid podcast. With that, I want to thank all of you listeners for downloading and tuning in every episode. We look forward to recording many more and bringing many more interesting conversations your way. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.